it's great to see everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for worship. And I want to pause and just give a special welcome to all of those who are joining us online this weekend. What a joy it is to greet you and thank you for making worship a priority. If you have a Bible, I want you to grab it and go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And when you get there, I want you to just hold that ready because uh, before we turn our attention to the Scripture, to that Scripture... I want to take a few minutes and share with you an exciting, what I think is an exciting update uh, through a video that we made this past Friday. Let's watch it together. Hey, church family, I want to take a minute to give you what I think is an exciting update. I'm sure you remember how a couple of years ago I told you we had the opportunity to buy a house that was next door to our Impact Fairfax campus. Now this house had been a dark and a dangerous place of drugs and prostitution and crime in the Fairfax neighborhood for a long time and it needed to be gone. Because of your generosity, we were able to purchase that house. We boarded it up and began to make plans to have someone come in and tear it down. Well, to make a long story short, it took longer than we thought to set that plan in motion. And in the meantime, God was working behind the scenes to provide another option. And through a member of our church, a ministry called Isaiah 117 reached out to us about the house. Isaiah 117 is a ministry that provides physical and emotional support in a safe and loving home for children who are awaiting foster care placement. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17 literally says, defend the cause of the fatherless. This ministry has these kinds of homes in four different states, including Indiana, and they were looking for a home in the exact area of Marion County where Impact Fairfax is located. After learning more about this, our elders made the decision to donate the house to this ministry so they could come in and create a safe and loving space for children who are in need. Now, I want to thank our Impact Fairfax Pastor Andrew Fillmore and our Impact Center Pastor Steve Saunders for doing a lot of the behind-the-scenes work on this, as well as Mount Pleasant member Kim Piercefield, who is deeply involved with Isaiah 117. Honestly, from the beginning, I thought the best thing to do was simply remove the house completely. But my attitude changed when I learned how the house could be redeemed and used by God to provide a loving and safe place for children who are vulnerable and in need. So I'm excited about what's going to be happening right next door to our Impact Fairfax campus. And I look forward to continuing to share this story with you as we get to have a front row seat to what God is doing. Thanks again for your generosity that made all of this possible. This is just another example of the kind of things that can happen in and through a church committed to change the world for Christ, one life, one family, one opportunity at a time. All right, I think that deserves a celebration. What do you think? Really exciting. I think it is really appropriate that our God, who is in the redemption business, somebody say amen to that, is going to be able to take and redeem this house and use it in a very, very positive way. In fact, Isaiah 117, they've already raised the funds uh, to do the remodel of this house, and I look forward to showing you what that looks like uh, along the journey. So stay tuned for more updates. All right, this weekend we're continuing this special sermon collection called Summer Mixtape which is basically five standalone sermons. And we began last week by talking about prayer. And this weekend, we're going to talk about integrity. The title of the message is The Journey to Integrity. Recently, I read the story of a man who saw an ad for a PlayStation 5 or a PS5 for sale in a local newspaper. And it was for sale at an unbelievably low price. Now, I'm not a video gamer. I don't know a whole lot about this, but I went and I talked to some people who do. And these video game consoles can go for several hundred dollars to over a thousand dollars. They're very expensive. So the guy calls the seller to see if it was still available and asks why it was being sold so cheap. You know, maybe there was something wrong with it. But the seller, in this case, a woman, didn't seem to know very much about this video game console. And she didn't offer any explanation on why the price was so low. So he just made arrangements to purchase it and set a time where he would go by the house and pick it up. When he got there, the woman greeted him, but he also met a very remorseful-looking man who was her husband. After confirming that it was the husband who had originally bought the console, he asked why he was selling it and why he was selling it so cheap. At that time, the PS5 had only been out for a short time, and there was a great demand for these video game consoles. Well, after a deep and a heavy sigh, the man confessed, the husband confessed, it turns out my wife can tell the difference between a PS5 video game console and an air purifier. See, what had happened was this man, this husband, 
had purchased this expensive video game console and told his wife it was actually an air purifier. He thought he could get away with that because the PS5, I think we might have a picture of one, has a very unusual shape right here, this part of it right here. But the problem was his wife started to ask too many questions. Questions like, why is the fan so quiet? And why does something like an air purifier need to be plugged into a large screen TV? <laughs> and in the end, he was busted for lying which is to say he was busted for a lack of integrity. Because while I could give you a lot of formal definitions for integrity, the bottom line is integrity is the practice of being honest. If I wanted to expand that a little, I would say integrity is the practice of being honest as a result of an uncompromising commitment to a strong moral value, to, rather to strong moral values or a strong sense of right and wrong. Another good way to define integrity would be be to say that integrity happens when your behavior matches your beliefs. And while trying to deceive your wife so you can buy an expensive video console or game console might not sound like a big deal, you can't help but be concerned about someone's willingness to lie to someone they love in order to get what they want. Perhaps the most blatant example of a lack of integrity that has been all over the media for the last couple of years is the college admission scandal. You know what I'm talking about. A number of wealthy people, people, including two Hollywood stars, were arrested for lying, cheating, and paying bribes in order to get their children into high-profile colleges and universities like Stanford and Yale and Georgetown and the University of Southern California. These families, who for the most part appeared to have pretty much every single thing that the world has to offer demonstrated a complete lack of integrity in a way that brought the world crashing down around them, and they're going to suffer the consequences of that for a long, long time. A lack of integrity is something that plagues, absolutely plagues our world, it plagues our country, it plagues our society, and it plagues our culture. There's not a lot of genuine honesty in the world today. In fact, I can stand up here and say with honesty, I can say with integrity that because of a lack of integrity in the world that we live in today, for the very first time in my life, I'm honestly not sure I can believe anything that I hear or anything that I can read anymore. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's just the reality of the world that we live in today. Shocking lack of integrity. Now, having said that, I want to make sure that we never make the mistake of confusing integrity with perfection because they are not the same thing, and there's a lot of differences. One of the most important differences is integrity will always be a process, and it's a process that will be both complicated and simple at the same time. It will be complicated because it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to develop integrity or consistency in every area of your life. It's simple because if you want to become a person of integrity, you can begin right now. You don't have to wait another day, another moment. You can begin right now. All you need to take to do is take your next step in the direction of integrity, and eventually, if you don't stop, you'll get there. So what I want to do with our remaining time is I want to Look at this from the perspective of the Scriptures. And I want to use this one passage of Scripture in particular, Psalm 119, to talk about three things that all of us need to focus on if we want to make sure that we are involved in the process of living lives of integrity for our entire lives. And so if you've got your Bible open to Psalm 119 and you're able tonight, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Scripture. Psalm 119 is our text. And all we're going to do is look at the very first eight verses. If you're familiar with Psalm 119, you know it's a very lengthy passage of Scripture, but we're just going to think about the first eight verses. You follow along as I read from my NIV Bible. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts 
that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask God's blessing on the reading and the hearing of his word. Here's what I want to do. I want to use these three verses, or excuse me, these verses to see three things that you have to focus on to be successful in the lifelong journey of integrity. If you're someone who likes to take notes, then write down a number one somewhere, and next to number one, write down these words, your source. That's where we'll start. Your source. And here's what I want you to know. No one, not you, not me, not anyone, can live a life of integrity apart from deciding once and for all what your source will be when it comes to the conduct and the character of your life. And the psalmist says, we just read it in that passage, the psalmist says that 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 source needs to be the word of God. In fact, look back at verses 1 through 3. The psalmist says, blessed are they whose ways are blameless. Now note this, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who, note this, keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You can't read those verses and not see the clear connection between obeying God's word and living a life of integrity. When you walk according to the law of the Lord and when you keep his statutes, the psalmist goes so far as to say you do nothing wrong. So let me ask you a very pointed question. What is the Bible to you? And while It's a question that can be answered in a variety of different ways. I don't want you to make it more complicated than I intend it to be. What is the Bible to you? You might say, well, pastor, it's the word of God. And that would be a correct answer. But while that would be a correct answer, I would follow up by saying, and what does that mean to you? You see where I'm going with this? I'm not asking what is the Bible. I'm asking what is the Bible to you? If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, then at some point the Bible has to be the book of instruction and direction for your life. In other words, it has to be the source and the foundation of your life because when you say that the Bible is the Word of God, you're acknowledging that it's different from every other book ever written. I love these words by N.T. Wright about the Bible. He said, the Bible is the book of my life. It's the book I live with, the book I live by, the book I want to die by. I wonder how many of us can say those same words with integrity. I think I told you some time ago that the greatest sermon I ever heard, the one that moved me more than any other message I ever heard, was a sermon from Psalm 19 for the most part, verses 7 through 11. In fact, if you've got a Bible and you're willing to do that tonight, hold your place in Psalm 119 and just go over to Psalm 19. It's just going to be to your left there from where you are right now. It's verses 7 through 11 that the message that I was moved by was based on, but the part that really spoke powerfully to my heart is found in verses 7 through 9. Look at those verses with me. In verses 7 through 9 of Psalm 19, David writes and says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. 
Now, you probably didn't notice this as I was reading those verses, as you were looking at them in your Bible or looking at them on the screen. But in verses 7 through 9, what you have are six lines with three elements in each line. You have a title for God's Word, you have a characteristic of God's Word, and you have a blessing of God's Word. Go back and look at it tonight and count them out for yourself. You'll see that there. I wish I could talk about everything that's said in verses 7 through 9, all six of those lines, but we don't have that much time. So let's just talk about the very first thing David says in Psalm 19 and verse 7, what we might call Psalm 19, verse 7a. Here's how it reads in my NIV Bible. David writes and says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And so we'll start with just the title that he gives to God's word. He calls it the law of the Lord. The key there is the word law. When David uses the word law, he's talking about instruction. That's what we need to know about the meaning of that word more than anything else. He's talking about instruction, but not just any kind of instruction. He's talking about divine instruction because it comes directly from God, the law of the Lord. I spent some time studying just this one sentence this past week, and it was absolutely fascinating for me. When David uses the word law to describe God's word, he's talking about instruction with direction. Not instruction just for the purpose of knowledge. He's talking about instruction with direction. He's talking about the kind of instruction that empowers someone and gives them a direction to proceed after in their life. That word law there in the original language of the Old Testament is the Hebrew word Torah, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with because it's used in a variety of different ways. It's the Hebrew word Torah. It means fundamentally instruction. But it's interesting that the Hebrew word Torah comes from a root Hebrew word, aura, which means light. And so that adds this dimension that the law of God is instruction that gives spiritual illumination for our lives and gives us everything. Everyone say everything. Everything we, know, we need to know to live life at its fullest. It's the manual provided by the manufacturer so we can know how to live. It's the complete explanation of God's will for man's life, not just in time and space, or in other words, not just for today, but forever, for all eternity. And that just scratches the surface of what it means to understand God's word, the Bible, as the law of the Lord. But we have to move on. The next thing David gives us is a characteristic for God's word in that first line. Psalm 19, verse 7a. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's perfect. And what does he mean by perfect? Well, at the risk of sounding really silly and redundant, the simple answer is it doesn't have any imperfection. In other words, it's not lacking anything. When the Bible says about itself, through David's words, the law of the Lord is perfect, what it's saying is that it's not lacking anything. You don't need the Bible plus something else. You just need the Bible alone. You don't need God's word and some addendum. You just need God's word alone. The Hebrew word for perfect is the word tamim. And it has the definition of being comprehensive. One Hebrew lexicon, as I studied this, here's what one Hebrew lexicon said about this comprehensive aspect of the law of God, the word of God. It described it as all-sided, all-sided so as to completely cover all aspects of a thing. And in this case, the thing is life, your life and my life in this sinful and broken world. And so when David writes the law of the Lord is perfect, he's saying nothing can be taken from it and nothing can be added to it because it's everything it needs to be. It's comprehensive. It's flawless. It's a flawless set of instructions that are completely sufficient for all of us. And that just scratches the surface of what it means when it says in Psalm 19, 7a, that the law of the Lord is perfect. And then David gives us a benefit of God's word. 
He, saw, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Remember what he said? Reviving the soul. And let me just tell you ahead of time, that word reviving basically just means transforming. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving, transforming the soul. But we don't have time to talk about the word transforming. Let's just talk about the word soul. That's the Hebrew word nefesh. And it's found all throughout the Old Testament. What's interesting is even though it's found all throughout the Old Testament, it's translated with a variety of different English words. In fact, over 20 different English words in our English Bibles are used to translate this one Hebrew word, nefesh. But the one thing each of the words has in common is they all make reference to the inner man, the inner person, the inner you, and the inner me. Now, the easiest way for us to understand what that means is if we think of it like this. They all refer to the part of your life, my life, the part of every life that God created that is eternal. How many of you know that there's a part of us that's eternal? It's called our soul. Your soul is going to live forever somewhere. There are two different destinations, but it's going to live forever. And so... God's word, what David calls the law of the Lord in Psalm 19 and verse 7, the first part of the verse, was not given to us as some kind of a moral code that we needed to try to live up to where sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. It was given to us, this divine instruction, this comprehensive and flawless instruction was given to us so that it could completely transform the deepest part of who we are. Think about that for a minute. Let me try to illustrate what that really looks like from a personal perspective. A couple of weeks ago, I was standing out there in the foyer, and a man walked up to me and he asked me a question. And this was his question. Why are you such a bad driver? (laughs) Now, in fairness to him, and he may be here, I don't know, in fairness to him, That's really not how he intended the question to come out. That was clear to me, and I wasn't offended by the question. And I can't remember word for word how I answered him, but I basically said, you know what? I'm not a bad driver. I'm an impatient driver. I'm not a bad driver. I don't have a string of accidents on my record. I don't have lots of tickets on my records. In fact, I haven't got a ticket It's been well more than 10 years ago since I got a ticket. I got it out here on Highway 37. I got a speeding ticket out here on Highway 37. I'd taken my car into the dealership for some work, and the dealer gave me a loaner car, and I was driving down Highway 37, not paying attention. That's my fault, and I was speeding. This car was a smoother, faster ride than the one that I drove normally, and before I knew it, I was speeding, and I got busted right there on Highway 37. I had to pay a pretty expensive speeding ticket. And what made it worse, because we live in such a small world, is somebody in this church processed that ticket when it came, and they made sure to tell me about it when they saw me the next week. (laughs) I'm not a bad driver. I'm an impatient driver. And there can be a difference between the two. This past week was a very busy week for me, especially considering that Monday was a holiday and we lost uh, time in the office. So I got up really early on Wednesday morning because I had a lot to get done. When I left my house, I said I would go to McDonald's and I would go through the drive-thru and grab some breakfast so I could get to my office and begin to work. But even though it was a really early hour in the morning, there was a lot of traffic out and all of the traffic in front of me, both on the road and in the drive-thru was very slow and annoying. (laughs) See, here's my problem. When I get in the car, all I think about is getting from point A to point B. That's all I think about. I don't sightsee. I don't look at my phone. I don't get caught up by what's on the radio. I pay attention to the four-way stop so I know when it's my turn to go and on and on and on. But how many of you know that's not the case with all people? So on this Wednesday morning, when all I wanted to do was go through the zip through the drive-thru, get my breakfast, get to my desk, get to work, I became frustrated and impatient. And at one point, I let out, well, let's just say an expression of my frustration and my impatience. And as soon as I did that, friends, I mean, as soon as it left my mouth, I 
was under conviction. I felt the conviction of God. And so right there in my car, while I'm driving down the road, I'm asking God for forgiveness. Now, listen, I didn't ask God to forgive me for failing to live up to some kind of moral code related to patience because the word of God, the law of the Lord, is not just a moral code that you and I do our best to follow. And if that's the way you think about the Bible, the Word of God, then you're mistaken. I'm just going to come out and say, you are just flat out mistaken. You're just flat out wrong. The Word of God, the law of the Lord, this comprehensive, flawless, divine instruction from God was given to us to transform us in the deepest part of who we are. And it was given to me in this case to transform my inner man in the area of patience. Not that that's the only flaw that I have in my life because I have way too many to list. Now, I could get up up tomorrow morning. I could look at myself in the mirror and say, starting today, starting today, I'm going to be a patient driver. I could put post-it notes all through my car reminding me to be a patient driver. I could record a CD in advance, put it in my car CD player, and listen to my voice telling me throughout the day, hey, take a breath. (laughs) Just relax. That driver in front of you is not a bad person. They might just be having a bad day. And on and on and on. And you know what would happen? I would be patient for a little while. And then... The reality of living in a community filled with two-lane roads, four-way stop signs, and people who don't pay attention will end up getting the best of me. How long do you think I would last? Maybe one day? Depends on how often I was in my car on that day. (laughs) What we need to know about God's Word, that's why I said, what is... God's word mean to you? What does the Bible mean to you? The thing we need to know about God's word is he didn't give it to us to fix the temporal elements of our human lives where we struggle and where we we have faults and flaws. He gave it to us to transform us on the inside. Galatians 5 tells us that patience is a fruit of the spirit. That means the only way I'm ever going to truly experience patience in every area of my life is to be so filled with the spirit that the spirit is given by me the freedom and the control to transform my life on the inside out. And I haven't done that yet, not completely. How about you? Have you? And so David writes in Psalm 19, verse 7a, and says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Everyone say perfect. Perfect. Reviving the soul. Transforming the soul. And this is just, listen, you know what, this, is, this just is one line, one brief line of this stunning description that David gives us of God's word in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9. You can't hear all that to say this. You can't. I don't care who you are. You cannot live a life of integrity without the right source. And for you and me as people of faith, the right source is the word of God. There's no other source. But it's not just enough to read it. And it's not, just, it's not enough just to view it as some kind of moral code to live up to. You have to let it transform you at the deepest part of who you are, your inner self, the part of you that's eternal. And let's just be honest, that, for the most part, takes a greater commitment than what most of us are willing to make when it comes to the Bible. If I think about the activities of my life and I compare them all against each other, there are a lot of things that I spend more time doing than reading, studying, and meditating on and memorizing God's Word in a way that transforms my soul. And I read the Bible at least on some level almost every single day. What about you? When you look at the activities of your life, what priority do you give the transformation of your inner man by the divine, flawless, comprehensive truth of God's Word. See, there's a reason why our world is plagued with a lack of integrity. 
There's a reason why so many people in our world today are confused and misguided about what at the end of the day are simple matters for crying out loud, are simple matters of right and wrong. Please, somebody say amen to that. There's a moral crisis happening in our country today. And if you're a Christian, if you're a genuinely committed follower of Christ, your stand in that crisis shouldn't be based on what political party you support or what your friends and your peer group believe or what you read online or who you follow on social media. It should be based on the comprehensive, flawless, and transforming truth of God's word. And if it has genuinely transformed your life, if God's word has genuinely transformed your life, then you should be able to stand up and speak that truth in any setting with an attitude of love and grace. You can't be responsible for how it's received, but you can be responsible for how it's shared. There is no integrity apart from a source of truth, and that source of truth for believers is the Word of God. Now, really quickly, I want you to write down a number two, and I want you to write down the next thing. The first one was your source. The next thing I want you to write down next to number two is yourself, just the word yourself. And what I mean by that is this. If you want to live a life of integrity, then you've got to come to a place where you're willing to be honest about yourself with regard to integrity. If I look back at Psalm 119, verses 4 and 6, this is what I see after emphasizing the importance of walking according to the law of the Lord in verses 1 through 3. David goes on to say this, You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. And listen, friends, it's verses 5 and 6 that really convict my heart. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. When you identify God's word as your source for living a life of integrity, and you spend time reading it, and you spend time studying it, and memorizing it, and meditating on it, you know what, will, what it will do? It will reveal things in your life that need to change and sometimes the revelation will be painful and sometimes the revelation will be shameful when you think about your life in relation to a holy God it can be painful and shameful I don't know what your experience is, but when I read the Bible, when I hear the Word of God, I like to listen to sermons. I listen to sermons throughout the week. I listen sometimes in my office. I listen sometimes at home. When I hear sermons that are, are, are focused on, on clear explanation of the Word of God, I feel the Holy Spirit at work in me. I feel Him revealing and convicting me with regard to my behavior, with regard to my thoughts, with regard to my words, with regard to my attitudes with regard to my motives. You can go on and on and on. And there are times when I feel genuine sorrow and shame over what is revealed. But I also remember that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, Paul wrote and said, godly sorrow brings repentance. And I also remember in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, John wrote and said, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, you, you, yourself, this is a, you are a powerful element of integrity because if you're going to live a life of integrity, you've got to be honest about the times when you failed and the areas where you failed. And you've got to take steps to make them right, knowing in the end that no matter how painful those steps may be, they will ultimately lead to your greatest moments of growth. I don't know if you recognize the name John Stott. He was a British pastor and theologian who had a significant impact on the evangelical world. He died in 2011 at the age of 86. And his last words to his assistant before he died at his bedside, his last words were these. Very simple, very short. He said, do the hard thing. And man, that's a recipe for a life of integrity right there to be willing to do the hard thing. That's what it takes to live a life of integrity. Real quickly, number three, write down a number three. I'm gonna do this fast, I promise. And next to number three, write down the words, your sincerity. We start with your source, the word of God, yourself, 
You've got to be honest with yourself. And the third thing is your sincerity. And what I mean by your sincerity is just your ongoing commitment to the never-ending process of integrity. I look back at Psalm 119, and I look at the last two verses. We read verses 7 and 8. The psalmist says, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read those words, I see commitment. I will praise you with an upright heart. I'm committed to doing that. And as I learn your righteous laws, I'm committed to doing that. I will obey your decrees. I'm committed to doing that. Do not utterly forsake me. Our lives should be committed to constantly learning the truth of God's word in a way that transforms us, not learning it for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of transformation. And I, I'm really captured by verse 8 when he says, I will obey your decrees, and then he adds these words, do not utterly forsake me. Now, I want you to listen to me really close because I don't want to be mis misunderstood about this. And I want to start by saying we, don't ever, we, we should never use just speculation or conjecture to try to understand the meaning of God's word. But having said that, let me just tell you that when I read these words, I will obey your decrees, and then these added words, do not utterly forsake me, then to me it's almost like the psalmist is saying, Lord, this might take a while. It might even take longer than I think, but I want to obey your decrees. My goal is to obey your decrees. And so, Lord, please don't give up on me. And here's God's answer, friends. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on me. This is the God who made the promise in the book of Hebrews, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God is not going to give up on you. Jesus, who was God in human flesh, knows the difficulty of living in this sinful, broken, and fallen world. That's why the Hebrew writer, after describing a little bit of the reality of what Jesus' experience was, in this world, what the experience of his life was in this world, wrote these words in Hebrews 4.16. He said, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God's not going to give up on you. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. He's not going to give up on us. Well, I'm out of time. I'm over out of time, so I need to close. Let me just repeat something I said in the very beginning. Living, living a life of integrity is a process that is both complicated and simple. It's complicated because it takes time. It takes time to develop consistency in every area of your life. It doesn't happen overnight. It's simple because if you want to become a person of integrity, if you can be honest enough about yourself to say, you know, I know this is not true of me in every part of my life. And if you want to become a person of integrity in every part of your life, it's simple in that you can start right now. You can take a step toward integrity right now. And probably the first thing to do is to be honest with yourself and honest with God. And so here's the way that we're going to close. If you were to start right now by being honest with yourself and honest with God, what's that going to look like for you? What does that really mean for you? I'm asking myself too. What does that mean for me? The journey to integrity starts with the first step. I want you to pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for our time in the Word tonight. And thank you for the chance to talk about something that is... Uh, so critically important and at times so very difficult. And help us to make sure that we have the right source. Help us to be honest with ourselves. And help us to have a sincere, dedicated approach that says, I'm not going to give up. Even if I slip up along the way, I'm not going to give up. Thank you that you never give up on us. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.